So far we haven't discussed the thrips at all, yet the thrips are in many situations the most common insect found that's feeding on plants, including the kinds of plants that we grow for fruits and vegetables, herbs. Extremely common, abundant insects that are not observed in most situations because of their minute size. So the thrips are in their own order. The order Thysanoptera, which means fringe-winged because they have a unique wing uh, with a central core with fringing on, along the outside. Uh, rarely will you see the wings displayed like this, plus they're very small in size, so you're not going to see the insect uh, uh, very well in any case, much less the wings. But uh, they are commonly associated with plants and they're going to be feeding on plants and they're going to feed with a type of mouth part that is designed to pierce and to remove fluids but their mouth part is arranged in mouth parts are arranged in a very different way so they feed in a different way than do say aphids or members of the order Hemiptera. So thrip mouth, thrips mouth parts are, are, are unique and probably the more interesting thing is that they only have a single mandible. Now remember the stylets of an aphid or a leafhopper are going to have a pair of mandibles and a pair of maxillae that together form a stylet bundle, but no, it doesn't function that way with thrips. They've got one mandible, the other one is vestigial, and that is, is uh, stout and it's used largely to puncture through the epidermis. So it's essentially like a big spike it allows them to punch through the epidermis. The maxillae are paired, they're long uh, and uh, slender, and they then penetrate more deeply into the plant and break up cells uh, underlying the epidermal cells. Uh, the labium is in the form of a cone that is pressed to the surface. So the mandibles are going to puncture through the plant, the maxillae are going to break cells, releasing cell fluids, and the labium forms a cone that allows them to then suck the released fluid up. So it kind of functions to puncture, kind of poke, and then suck. Puncture with the mandible, poke with the maxillae, and then suck it all up. So in this case we see a couple thrips, two on the left. Uh, the little cone is what I'd like you to, to be looking at that's kind of underneath the head fairly near the, the first pair of legs is, is where it seems to arise and uh, they feed on the, the surface of the plant. But very small little cone, that's their mouth parts, but the, within it are the maxillae which can penetrate more deeply. Now as a result of this kind of feeding you're going to have cells that have had the contents removed. Uh, these are mesophyll feeders uh, like the leafhoppers we just discussed. So the kind of symptom you see is similar to those that feed on mesophyll. You're going to see little silvery areas because the chlorophyll has been removed from the plants. Furthermore, they leave a small dark fecal spot, much like other mesophyll feeders like the mesophyll feeding leafhoppers. Uh, the spots produced by thrips will be much smaller than leafhoppers because they are much smaller animals. Uh, but the silvery uh, pattern and the small dark spots is, is a really good diagnostic feature to indicate that you had thrips feeding on a leaf. So the effects you're going to see if they are feeding on leaves will be little flecking wounds. Uh, onions probably show it the best in the upper left picture. Uh, the leaves, if they were undamaged, would be a uniformly uh, dark green, but a lot of them look kind of silvery, and those are the result of uh, numerous feeding puncture and uh, feeding damage site uh, incidents for, uh, produced by thrips on this, these onions. On the um, cabbage on the right, uh, that is a, a tougher, more waxy leaf, and you don't see uh, the symptom is dramatic, uh, uh, but it uh, is, is present. You can see there's silvery areas where they've been feeding, a little bit of dark spotting where the fecal spots have, have occurred. And if they feed on developing leaves, then that can cause the young emerging leaf to uh, not be able to fully extend in a, in a normal way. So you might get a little curling 
uh, as indicated in the uh, picture of the maple leaves in the lower left that have been affected by thrips. In rare cases, uh, you might also get a reaction of the plant to this. Uh, in the case illustrated here, we see thrips on cabbage in the upper left. They're just feeding on the leaves, but some cabbage will respond to this kind of wound that they're producing by producing a hyper uh, response in terms of callus formation. So you get scabby little patches forming, which makes the injury perhaps even more obvious than it would in the absence of such a robust plant response. Thrips don't limit their feeding to leaves, however. Uh, they'll feed in flowers, and if they're feeding within a flower and there is a developing fruit trying to form, they'll feed on the surface of the fruit, and this will result in a small little scar that as the fruit continues to grow it will become a more obvious scar. So the uh, deformities all illustrated here are all done by thrips feeding on these fruit uh, at a very early stage in their development because they're usually associated with the flowers and the very young fruit. Or they may just damage the flowers. Uh, there are a great many uh, flowers that are, are affected by thrips. Uh, in fact, it's uh, often difficult to find flowers in late summer that don't have thrips in them, uh, although you often will not see symptoms uh, because they won't be in high number. But you'll see scarring associated with thrips if they're in blossoms. They're feeding on the young flower. They might be feeding on the flower petals even after they've emerged. And, and most all of the thrips that you find in the flowers are going to be those in the genus Franklinella, which are sometimes collectively known as flower thrips and they particularly uh, like to feed within flowers. Uh, there is one exception uh, of, a, of a thrips that is associated with flower that's in a different genus, and that's gladiolus. Gladiolus has its own thrips. The gladiolus thrips, um, and although most thrips have a broad host range, the gladiolus thrips is pretty much just associated with gladiolus. Uh, so uh, if you have a chronic situation on that plant, that's the critter. Now the life cycle of thrips is uh, unique. Uh, it, it is of the simple metamorphosis type, but it has a little twist. Uh, so you're going to see some things happening as they progress to the adult stage that is a little different than we might see, in particular having some non-feeding stages, two non-feeding stages. So the basic uh, life stages of the thrips will have on plants is we're going to have an egg that will hatch and then we'll have two stages, uh, one after the other, that are feeding. Then we'll have two stages that don't feed and these are usually present in the soil. They drop from the plant and then we'll have an adult. So let's go through this life cycle. Thrips are going to insert their eggs into leaves, petals, perhaps even a developing fruit. And they're going to insert it with the ovipositor. The female has a, a little spike-like ovipositor at the tip of her abdomen, and she uses this to insert the eggs into the, the plant part, the leaf, the flower petal, the uh, developing fruit. And this actually sometimes uh, results in a kind of injury that may be obvious. Uh, uh, subtle, but obvious. An oviposition wound, where the uh, fruit in particular, uh, if it has been uh, had, had an egg laid in it during an early stage will develop a little cloudy area. And in this case, it's not from the feeding, it's rather from the process of egg laying. So these are oviposition wounds on a tomato, the little dark spots, on a pepper, the little light spots, on some apples on the lower left, and on a pea pod. The pea pod, and to a less extent, uh, the um, apples and also in the uh, peppers uh, often will have a uh, kind of a cloudy area around the injured site um, and this is sometimes called a, a pansy spot or halo spot and in the center of that symptom will be where the egg had originally been inserted. Eggs hatch and the next two stages are the primary feeding stages. In star 1, very small. In star 2, quite a bit larger. 
although still quite small. Thrips never get big. So here on an onion leaf would be uh, some thrips uh, found within the, the tight uh, uh, leaves at the base of the uh, onion plant. And uh, the smaller ones would be in star one, larger ones in star two. You can see the silvery effects of the feeding areas that have been damaged, uh, the little dark spots, the little, uh, fecal spots they've left behind. And when those are completed, then they move on to stage three nymph. Now stage three nymph doesn't feed, and usually they drop to the plant to be the stage three and they molt and the wings become partially developed. They're not moving, they're in the same place and then they molt again. So you have stage four and it is uh, a little bit more progressively like the adult form. The wings are a little closer to being fully developed so you see quite large wing pads in the last nymphal stage. But stages three and four, non-feeding, often not on the plant, and then you get the adults. Now, we've talked about the kinds of injuries thrips themselves can do to plants uh, in terms of scarring leaves, scarring fruit, uh, inserting eggs into developing fruit, but the biggest kind of injury that thrips usually do is vector certain kinds of viruses that produce disease in plants. And there are some very serious thrips transmitted viruses. Uh, the big one is tomato spotted wilt and also quite important is a patient's necrotic spot. Uh, in the bulbs uh, like onion and garlic, iris yellow spot can be an issue too. But tomato spot, tomato spotted wilt virus and a patient's necrotic spot virus are extremely common and very damaging viruses. The Viruses that are transmitted by thrips, be it tomato spotted wilt or a patient's necrotic spot, often have some symptoms that you should be aware of. And a very common kind of symptom on foliage is what we call a ring spot, where there'll be a, 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 a central area that is uh, a little uh, darker or, or um, than, than a surrounding lighter area. And so it might be somewhat circular uh, and there will be multiple uh, symptoms of this kind on, on a leaf. So here we see different kind of ring spot symptoms on foliage of, of various plants produced by tomato spotted wilt virus. And here are some on some leaves of some ornamental plants uh, produced by impatience necrotic spot. Impatience necrotic spot is primarily an issue on some of the plants we grow for ornamentals tomato spotted wilt goes to the extremely wide range of uh, crops including most vegetables, uh, not just tomatoes. Uh, there's uh, uh, very few plants that cannot be affected by tomato spotted wilt. We can see ring spot symptoms on fruit. And again, this is tomato spotted wilt virus. Uh, symptoms uh, fairly dramatic in the upper left on a tomato, quite subtle on the lower left. That was actually a tomato purchased at a supermarket. And you can, you can see the, the ring spot symptoms on the uh, fruit of a pepper. It doesn't always show up with those classic symptoms. Uh, you may have necrotic lesions without ring spots. Uh, these would both be pictures that do show infection with Lathrop's transmitted virus. And you'll also see wilting very commonly associated with it. Tomato spotted wilt gets its name because the virus may cause lesions, cause dead areas to, uh, to uh, develop in stems, which will then prevent the movement of water and nutrients, so you'll get, get wilting. Uh, it may not completely kill the plant. It may just stunt the plant, sometimes severely. So in the picture, three pictures we have illustrated here, we see lesions on the stem of a plant the tomato spotted wilt. Uh, we see a plant in the upper right, a pepper plant that has essentially entirely wilted from the effects of tomato spotted wilt, which by the way would be a, a kind of symptom you might see say from some root disease, but if it's tomato spotted wilt the roots will be fine, they'll be white, 
Uh, and then in the lower lower right, we see a field of peppers that was planted with plants that had infection of tomato spotted wilt, and uh, as you can see, almost all of them are severely stunted. The field was essentially a, a total loss. This is a disease, uh, as is impatience necrotic spot, that is almost entirely associated with thrips in greenhouses in this part of the country. So tomato spotted wilt virus is usually present in garden crops if the transplants were infected in the greenhouse before we purchased them or in our own greenhouse or uh, if we're trying to grow, grow our own plants. Uh, the spread of the virus within the field is, is much more limited. It does occur uh, in, in southern parts of the U.S. it occurs extensively, but most times when people have tomato spotted wilt uh, on their vegetable crops, it's because the plants got infected as transplants before they were put out in the field. Now, there's a couple things that I think are of interest in terms of how tomato spotted wilt and impatience necrotic spot are transmitted by thrips. Again, the ability to transmit a virus is a very involved process requiring close biological association between the pathogen and the vector. And in the case of tomato spotted wilt and patients necrotic spot, thrips are the only insect vector. Uh, tomato spotted wilt isn't transmitted by aphids, not leaf hoppers. Uh, it's the only insect that can transmit uh, the pathogen from one plant to another. And insects do not spread these viruses. Um, Thrips can only acquire the virus, however, if they feed on an infected plant in the very first stage of their life, that instar one. So essentially they have to be developing on a virus-infected plant for them to be able to pick it up. The virus cannot be acquired by a second stage nymph, even if it feeds on a plant that has the uh, virus in it, or an adult, which is a good thing because it would be a lot more difficult to manage if adults could pick it up uh, in, in a flight to a plant and then move it to another plant. So they have to be developing on a plant uh, in order to acquire it uh, and you can only acquire it during that first stage. And this has something to do with the way the uh, internal organs are, are arranged in the thrips during the first stage that allows the virus to migrate from the foregut into the brain. Uh, and then move into the body. But once infected, thrips can transmit it for life. So thrips can only spread the virus as the first stage nymphs are developing, but once they've acquired it, they are vectors for the rest of their life, which for thrips is usually uh, a matter of a few weeks, although thrips can survive between seasons. Uh, uh, outdoors is as an adult form, and if they're infected, uh, they will survive for many months during the cold season. Now, if you have a problem with thrips transmitted virus diseases, this is an es essentially a sanitation issue that is best managed by eliminating the virus. The thrips themselves are much less of a problem uh, without the vi presence of the virus. So if you can eliminate all sources of the virus, then that is by far the best way to begin to get a handle on this kind of problem. Now, tomato spotted wilt virus can go to extremely wide range of plants. And so you have to make an intensive effort to identify all sources of the virus could be weeds in the, on the, growing on the floor, it could be crops, uh, but all, all plants that are infected and destroy them and do this thoroughly. I mean, there can be zero tolerance for a plant that has tomato spotted wilt uh, in, in, a, in a, a greenhouse situation because it will serve as a recurring source of new infection. This is handled by eliminating. So again, make an intensive effort to identify all sources of the virus and destroy them, and then do it again. Uh, make sure you get all the plants. Leave none 
and you will have to uh, remove these plants and remove them promptly because if you have a plant that is infected with tomato spotted wilt and say it has thrips on them and you just pull the plant and leave it there the thrips can continue to develop and the thrips that are uh, going to emerge subsequently will be carrying the pathogen so you will have to get rid of them immediately outside uh, destroy them and uh, make sure you are thorough leave none there can be zero tolerance for having a tomato spotted wilt or a patient's necrotic spot uh, virus infected plant once you have done that you can start thinking about what to do about the thrips but if you haven't managed eliminating the source of the virus you will never get a handle on this problem so considerations of, of going after the thrips is important but secondary to the primary objective to eliminate source of the virus so we can do things to try to exclude thrips we can trap thrips we can use insecticides uh, and if all we're worried about are thrips as a uh, as a pest and we don't have the pathogen uh, we can use some biocontrols so excluding thrips is done by uh, walls or screens now the problem with thrips and screening is that thrips are extremely small and most screens will not exclude thrips uh, so you have to use a very very fine mesh uh, there are thrips proof screens that are sold now when you use a very fine mesh it can uh, complicate things because the uh, the air movement is going to be impeded by the very fine mesh so sometimes you have to build structures in order to use this to cover the vents uh, in, a, in a way that uh, can prevent the thrips from coming in thrips by the way uh, should be mentioned are insects that are not strictly greenhouse uh, uh, they are found everywhere uh, the thrips that affect greenhouses can be found on grasses, they can be found on broadleaf plants. Uh, so there's continued sources of thrips available in, in uh, the growing season pretty much anywhere that could move into buildings uh, and subsequently establish themselves. Thrips can be trapped. Uh, uh, thrips are trapped typically using uh, colored sticky traps and both yellow and baby blue and actually baby blue is probably even more attractive but uh, uh, both those colors are can be used uh, they're going to be small thrips are small uh, no getting around that and uh, uh, this is what they might look like if trapped on a, a sticky card with a fungus gnat which is a small insect on itself looking huge in comparison and it's possible to get some suppression of thrips like you could with white flies if you had large areas of sticky surface to trap them again all you're going to trap is some of the adults the traps are not going to affect the nymphs that are feeding on the plant that don't fly and of course the non-feeding stages in the soil aren't going to be attracted to the traps so you'll get a at best a fraction of the adult population uh, so it can be useful for retarding population increase but by itself it's not going to control the problem thrips can be managed with biological controls in interior escape, uh, escape settings uh, greenhouses and the like um, the, there are different kinds of biological controls that can be considered uh, if you have life stages of thrips on the foliage that is what you're going after usually we're talking about predatory mites uh, however there are also life stages of thrips that occur in the soil the instar 3 and 4 and these can be controlled to some degree by biological controls that are applied to the soil to target those stages so the kinds of things that might be used to control thrips on leaves are usually predatory mites uh, and there are some predatory mites that are uh, specific to thrips the minute pirate bugs also uh, could be considered they're, they're generalist predators who will eat a lot of thrips as well as spider mites and several of these are available through uh, biological control suppliers and these could be used again to suppress thrips in some sort of indoor growing operation um, this again 
presumes that you do not have virus, that your problem is just thrips. If you have virus, you got to get rid of the plants. If all you have is thrips, then you can consider these biological controls. Insect parasitic nematodes or predator mites can be used in the soil. So uh, insect parasitic nematodes, particularly the species Steinernema feltii, can be applied as a drench to the soil and they will kill thrips. Uh, the soil predator mite is a species of mite that uh, lives in soil as the name may indicate and is a generalist predator so it might eat other little arthropods that are in soil uh, but also would feed on instar 3 and instar 4 non-feeding stages of thrips were they to be encountered. Insecticides for thrips control uh, can be used but Thrips are a difficult target for use of insecticides. A couple of things. First of all, at any one point in time, about half of the population is in stages that are not accessible to being killed by insecticide. They are an egg within a leaf, or they're non-feeding stages that are in the soil. And you spray the leaves, neither of those are going to be killed by the treatment. Insecticides are therefore marginally effective for thrips control. Uh, there are some that are, are uh, better than others, uh, and in combination with some of the other uh, kinds of management, the trapping and sanitation, uh, you might be able to get a, a, a good handle with insecticides. However, if you are considering using insecticides to control thrips with the idea that that is going to help you with a thrips transmitted virus in patients necrotic spot or tomato spotted wilt, this is incorrect thinking. Uh, you cannot prevent thrips from transmitting viruses from use of insecticides. Uh, the insecticides don't work fast enough. Again, if the situation involves a virus, you have to get rid of the infected plants. The kinds of chemical controls we have for thrips, probably the one of the, the more commonly available ones and uh, are the Spinoset products. Uh, these can, are available over the counter as well as in commercial formulations. Uh, Spinoset is uh, also in some formulations uh, allowed in certified organ organic production. There are also some chemically related synthetic Spinosins, uh, Spirotetramats, Spintram, uh, that also work and some of the insect growth regulators uh, can work on, on thrips as well. Now, one last thing about thrips, uh, just in summary uh, about some of the, the oddities of them as, a, as an insect life form. Among the insects, thrips have a unique wing type, a unique form and function of the mouth parts, a unique metamorphosis pattern with that two non-feeding stages and it's an odd name. Thrips is a strange name. It is uh, uh, a name that just doesn't sound right and uh, sometimes you, we will see it uh, misspoken as thrip. Now thrip is not a word. Thrips is the word to describe these kind of insects, the common name in English. So there is no such thing as a thrip. Even though you might see the word used uh, in extension publications sometimes and uh, very often in uh, commercial packages such as the uh, one indicated in the lower right flower thrip, there's no such thing as a thrip. Thrips is both singular and plural. It's one thrips, two thrips, a million thrips, but again no such thing as a thrip, so don't ever say that, and that could be on the test.